Okay, it is now seven o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, welcome to tonight's uh, Writers Workshop. My name is Salim and I will be serving as your host tonight and will help navigate questions. Our topic tonight is Plot Development, presented by author Nadine Kenny Johnston. Uh, before I introduce Nadine, uh, I do want to share a few updates about the library. So we are open and back to our regular hours, um, but if you don't feel comfortable coming into the library just yet, uh, we did continue offering our curbside delivery service. This is where you can request items at home and pick them up in front of the library. For more information on that, you can visit champagne.org slash curbside. Uh, if you have questions for staff, there are a few ways you can reach out to us. You can schedule a consultation at champagne.org slash book a librarian. You can chat with us uh, Monday through Friday. And you can email us at librarian at champagne.org. Um, I also want to share a few uh, instructions for communicating through Zoom tonight. So depending on your device at the bottom of the screen, uh, you should see the option to chat, which will allow you to type your question in. Next to that is the option to raise your hand um, if you prefer to use your microphone and I can unmute you. Yeah, there will be some writing exercises uh, throughout tonight's workshop. Um, so if you want to share with the group, use the chat feature or raise your hand. Um, we will also have time for questions at the end of the workshop as well. With that said, I'd like to now introduce our presenter. Nadine Kenny Johnstone is the author of the memoir of This Much I'm Sure, which was named Book of the Year by the Chicago Writers Association. She currently teaches at Loyola University and received her MFA from Columbia College, Chicago. Her other stories and interviews have been featured in places such as Chicago Magazine, The Magic of Memoir, The Author Author Podcast, and the Don't Keep Your Day Job podcast. Nadine is also a writing coach and she's worked with authors around the globe. And tonight, she's here to share her tips on plot development with all of us. Nadine, thank you so much for being here and I will turn it over to you. Hi everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. And so I am a writing coach and I coach people not only through writing essays, stories, but also books. And one of the biggest things that comes up for people is plot. <laughs> How do I navigate plot? What do I do around plot? And what I really say is that plot comes down to two things that people often don't think a lot about. One of them is structure and the other one is description. So I'm going to walk you through those things, okay? So first and foremost, when we think about plot, I want you to think about the shape of a W, okay? So the shape of the letter W. I went to a writing workshop years and years ago, and uh, the woman who was leading it, her name is Mary Carol Moore, and at the time I was trying to figure out how to structure my memoir, which ended up um, being written fully a couple of years after her workshop. I was in the beginning stages of kind of plotting it out, and she really led us into this interesting structure ex exercise that I had never thought about before. So it's the shape of a W. So she drew a W on the whiteboard and I thought, what does this have to do with anything? And she started really breaking it down. And what she taught us is what I'm going to reiterate to you, but kind of build on from there. Okay. So when she was explaining this to us, she said, okay, think about that top point of a W. So if we have the W shape, think about that top point. So most stories, whether you're writing fiction, nonfiction, doesn't matter. Most stories have some kind of event that sets everything into motion, right? And this is the sort of event where without this thing, then the rest of the book would not exist at all. So some people might call it the inciting incident or the triggering event, domino event, the thing that kind of set everything into motion. And when you sit there and think about it and your brain might already start, be starting to go through some ideas for this, you really start to think about it. It is the thing that propels the rest of the plot. 
So a modern day example of this, if any of you have read the memoir um, Wild by Cheryl Strayed, right? It's about a woman who goes hiking in, in the wilderness for 90 days. And, um, and we see that really what sets the entire journey into motion is not the beginning of the hike itself. It's what happens years before then, a couple years before then, with the passing of her mother. And because she's on an emotional journey, she decides to do something different, something unexpected, and she goes on this hike right? So really, that was the event that set the rest of the thing into motion. So now I want you to start turning your wheels a little bit and think about, okay, well, in a scene I'm writing or in a story I'm writing, or maybe if I'm working on a book, whatever you might be working on, what is the thing that sets everything else into motion? What is that thing? What is that event? All right? So when you go from there, notice if you're going to follow the shape of a W, you start moving downward, that first kind of leg of the W. And if you're thinking about this in terms of events and structure, you might go, okay, anything that happens in say that first fourth of your story are things that complicate the plot. They complicate the narrative. It doesn't mean that all the events that happen along that path are negative or bad. It just means that things start to get complicated. There are obstacles. There are people in one's way. There are things that are happening that are distracting the, the main character. It doesn't matter. But there are complications. There are complications along the way. Okay, so if we keep on sticking with that story by Cheryl Strayed, we might think about, well, and so this narrator decides to go on a hike in the woods, but there are some definite complications. So one, this character has never actually hiked <laughs> out in nature for an extended period of time. So she's done little weekend backpack trips, so on and so forth, but has never hiked for an extended period of time backpacking. So that's a complication. Uh, she starts packing her stuff and she realizes it doesn't even all actually fit into the backpack that she has purchased. And the pack is actually too heavy for her to carry this, but she doesn't figure that out until the very first day of her 90 day hike, okay? So she's carrying a pack that she can't even carry um, and then she begins on her hike and she realizes her first night she goes to sit down and um, make her first dinner out in the wilderness and she has purchased the wrong fuel for her stove okay for her camping stove so these are complications they add to it so when you think about that first leg, there's an event that sets everything into motion and then things get sort of complicated. Think about this might be in the form of um, obstacles, but it could be in the form of characters getting in one another's way. It could be in the form of one's own mindset. So maybe for your main character, their own mind is getting in their way, right? That might be another thing. So layers, complication. All right, so when we're beginning on this journey as we're traveling, usually we're going on one of two paths. So in any TV show or any book you read, doesn't matter, any story, there's usually one of two paths. One is character wants something, faces obstacles, will try their hardest to get it. Usually something gets really in their way and there's a low point, but at the end they either get it or something else they didn't even know they wanted, okay? The other kind of setup is that at the beginning a character has something, tries their hardest not to lose it, faces obstacles and complications, either loses it or comes close to losing it, and at the end is left with either something else or that final thing. So keep that in your mind as you're thinking about this plot journey. So we have a character who is set into motion, they're going along their path, and if we continue following that W, we see that, okay, well, what's at the end of the first leg of the W? There's a point. 
And we like to think of this as maybe the first low point. It's a first low point. And it happens at different points in a narrative depending on the writer. So maybe it's a fourth of the way through, a third of the way through, it doesn't matter, but there's some kind of low point. This is where a main character might be questioning things. They're sitting there going, what do I do? Um, things have not panned out how they've wanted. There's expectation versus reality and reality is winning, right? There's some kind of dark night of the soul at that first low point. But then typically what can happen is we start going up towards that middle peak of the W. And this doesn't mean that everything happen, happening along the way is the most wonderful thing. It just means that the narrative is flowing in a new direction. The narrative is flowing in a new direction. Oftentimes when people think about plot, they think that they need action, 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 action. That's not always the truth. What we need is movement, some kind of flow, but variation, variation is key, okay? We get the same kind of action over and over again or the same kind of events, you know, that it doesn't make for a great plot. But if we think about variation, that really engages your reader. They want that variation. So that's why when we're talking about moving towards like the middle point of the W, adding some new information, that starts to feel really satisfying to the reader. So what would that look like, okay? This is where maybe new characters come in. You have uh, mentors or allies. You have um, new information is provided in the narrative. There's some kind of new direction, new adventure, new journey, new idea, new something. And while all narratives don't follow a straightforward W structure, this is simply meant to get you thinking about variation. It's meant to get you thinking about your own structure. What is complicating your story? What is adding newness to your story, right? That's what we're thinking about here. Okay, so say we're traveling up this middle part of the W and we get to a high point. This might be finally where a main character is feeling elated. They're feeling, they have a proud moment. They have a moment of success. They have a moment of breakthrough. They have a moment of connection. And it's like, oh, okay. And it gives the reader just enough hope that they keep on rooting for <laughs> the narrator or the main character. So the reader is like, yes, yes, yes. If it's all, <laughs> if it's all complication, 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 without any little wins, then the reader starts to get very, very discouraged, <laughs> right? So something else to be thinking about as you are trying to provide some kind of plot structure is to be thinking about what are those little moments of wins or what are those little moments of success like for your main character? What are the moments of connection? What are the moments of feeling of accomplishment or purpose, of new ideas, of satisfaction, of gratitude, okay? So we've gone doot, doot, right? And you already know what's coming next, <laughs> the next kind of downward leg of this W. And if we were to imagine it really as a W, it would be kind of lopsided. So it's kind of like we have, you know, this second, this second W is really a low point. And as we think about that, that as we're going down that that leg, we're having more complication, more obstacles, or more things that are getting in the way. But always think about any book or TV show that you have been a part of or read or watched. That moment, kind of towards the end, just before we get some kind of wrap up, there's the lowest of the low. There is the darkest night of the soul. So say in some kind of TV show, right, um, this 
person is opening their own business and they just want this so badly. They want to serve their community and they have to go against all of this adversity. And then finally they're breaking through and, uh, you know, things are going great, but then something happens and there are all these complications. And then it's like the lowest of the lowest moment where the character is just going, what have I done? There's no way out of this. They're in just deepest of despair or can't find their way through. That is the lowest of the low moment when we think about that W and we think about that very, very low point, okay? Yours doesn't have to even be a W. It could be a zigzag, you know, just thinking about the up, down, up, down. It doesn't have to be a straightforward W, but every narrative has that low, low, low moment. Because think about what it does to a reader. Plot is not actually about your characters and about your narrative. It's about reader engagement. That's what plot is. It's about reader engagement. How to get your reader to care about your story and characters. That's what this is. And so if we're thinking about what makes readers care, it's when they see a main character who has risked things, who has struggled, who has had self-doubt, has had these really low moments and they're trying to figure out how to get through. They're trying to figure out how to get through. Because think about it, if the stakes are not high, then we don't care as much. We don't care as much as readers. So you know, say back to that example about like someone starting their business and really trying to make it work. Say the person, um, you know, has this wonderful savings and opened up the business and everything went great. And if the business fails, it's okay because they've got a backup plan and everything is okay. Nothing's at stake. Nothing's at risk. Nothing, nothing is on the line. So that lowest of the low moment is where everything is on the line. Just about everything's on the line. If those of you who have read Cheryl Strayed's Wild, if we think about that, well, she has, spoiler alert, a moment in her memoir where there are a couple of low, low moments. And one of the biggest of them is a primal thing where she's in the middle of nowhere and there's supposed to be a water source and the sun is pelting down. It is so, so hot. She has no water on her and there's supposed to be a water source and the water source is empty and there is no water source for miles and miles and miles. And she's really facing this moment where she's terrified uh, that she might not survive. I call that a low moment, right? <laughs> now, not every plot needs that kind of like moment of life or death situation, but we do need something where things are really at stake. Things are at stake, okay? So we've gone do, do, do. And now how do we end? How do we conclude? Where do we go? Well, you know, I know that the happy tied up in a bow ending is very well or overly done in a lot of the TV shows that we watch and things like that. You can have your pretty bow ending, but usually what readers want is some form of closure. They don't need for everything to be wonderful and perfect. They're looking for either a little bit of closure but most importantly, revelation, change, a shift in perspective. What they're looking for at the end, that last little leg up on the, on the W, is they are looking to just see what has the narrator or main character learned? How are they different? What is the growth? So when we do, do, do that last bit is about the growth. How has the main character changed? What has this journey taught them? What new ideas or perspectives do they have, right? What has shifted for them? That's what a reader is looking for at the end. 
some are kind of nauseated by the everything's wonderful now. No, we're usually not looking for that. We are looking for, I've learned a little bit or this experience has shaped me somehow. That's what we're looking for. So whenever people, you know, we're working on stories or essays or books together and we're really thinking about plot, I like to map out. I like to think of this tactile mapping out and really thinking about, okay, what is the movement of the narrative? What is the variation that we face? And ultimately, how is the main character different at the end than they were at the beginning? How have they shifted their perspective? How have they changed? How have they grown? Okay, so I want you to be thinking about that. Now, take out your a piece of paper, you know, just have a notebook nearby, have it nearby. And I want you to make a little bit of a list of some scenes or stories that you're currently working on or you're thinking about writing, you know, so your list might not make sense to anyone else. You know, you might say on there, I want to write that story about going to Maine. Nobody else knows what that means, but you do. I want to write that scene about that rainstorm. So you have a list of things that you want to write about. So in my office at home, where I've been spending a lot of time, right? Uh, we, I have a list of all of the different sorts of stories or scenes that I want to write about so that when I get to the actual Word doc or Google doc or the notebook, I'm not empty, that I have something to choose from. So I could look at any of these stories that I want to write about, and I could think about the shape, right? I could think about the shape. And some people, what they do is they have maybe a big whiteboard and they, they draw these kind of up, down, up, down, or they have a poster board and they draw up, down, up, down. And some people take little moments, little moments, and they put them on sticky notes and they kind of plot it out, right? So in that workshop that I did years ago that I mentioned, we had big poster boards and we wrote like a big W and we, we um, took little scenes, little moments, and we wrote each of them individually on sticky notes and we put them on the W and we picked them up, moved them around and we just played with it. We made it a really tactile experience. And I think oftentimes we're so on our computers all the time that we forget that as creatives, we can play around. We, if our stories and our narratives want movement, then maybe we can move things around. So what I do, in addition to that, that workshop kind of sparked me to do a lot of things. You know, I take over space on the floor and I take scenes and I move them around. Or, you know, I get creative with my marker board and I think about, okay, where can this go? Where can this go? And I try to figure out like the shape of the narrative that I'm writing. And I try to see, is there movement? Is there variation? And ultimately, is there growth, okay? And so one way to approach this is to look at your list of scenes or stories and maybe choose one of them and go, okay, well, I wanna write that story about Maine. Okay, what are kind of some of the key moments that happen? And you just kind of plot them along in your notebook and map it out first before you get into the actual writing because it will say to you, do I have enough variation here? Do I have complications? Do I have new characters and information? Do I have little moments of success um, or understanding? Do I have a real low, low moment? Do I have some growth or revelation at the end? You know, it gets you thinking about a zoomed out perspective of your story. Because oftentimes, what do we do? We sit down to write and we just expect it to just like flow out of our fingers. <laughs> We're just like, oh, genius will come. And we really haven't sat there and given it this overarching look and thought about the shape of it and just played around with it and experimented with it, okay? So say you do that 
and we might have time a little bit later to, to kind of play around, but say you do that and you're like, okay, I think I'm starting to see the shape of it. And if you're fiction writers, you always ask yourself the question, right? Like what would happen if, what would happen if? So I was an undergrad at Champaign-Urbana and I studied English and then I went to um, Columbia College in Chicago for my grad school program, my MFA in creative writing. And uh, for a good while there, I studied fiction before I ended up also writing nonfiction. So I've done both genres for quite a while. And so always we were thinking about what would happen if, let's just try, let's just see, okay? So if you're writing fiction and you're looking at that shape and you're feeling like there's not enough movement, you go, what would happen if I added some complication here? What would happen if someone got in the way of that other person's desires? What would happen if an ally or a mentor came in here? What would happen if the main character finally had a moment of, of success? What would happen if on and on and on, okay? But then the other really cool thing that I love to do is if you're kind of like, all right, I'm doing the tactile thing and you're about to write, but you go, I still feel like I'm stuck. I don't know where to go. Then the most helpful thing that I do is scene development visualization. Okay, so we're gonna do this together. And when I do this, I close my eyes. So you're gonna see me with my eyes closed the whole whole time. So later on, if you're someone who's watching the recording, um, this is a time when we get into the scene development you can close your eyes too because I'm just gonna have my eyes closed, okay? So I'll give you a little background before we get into it. At Columbia College, my first day in grad school, right? I'm in the South Loop in Chicago in this super cool arts building. It's my very first grad school class. I'm really nervous. And I walk into the room and it's, um, it's a few, well, 12 desks that are in a semicircle. First of all, I wasn't expecting that, in a semicircle. And then the instructor was kind of in the middle. And I was like, hmm, what's this? You know, I'm used to just staring straight ahead. So I sit down at one of the desks and we launch into this scene development visualization that I'm about to do with you, a version of it. And I'm going, what is going on? <laughs> what is this? It is the thing I'm most grateful for having learned there and the thing that I've taken and morphed and kind of transformed and that I do now with people and people tend to say that it's the most helpful part. All right, are you ready? Let's try. Close your eyes and take a deep breath. And what we're about to do is imagine that inside of our brains, there's only almost like a movie theater, okay? So it's like we can see our stories play out like a film in our brains. So vivid, so visceral. Maybe even at times it feels like 3D or 4D. We almost feel like we're part of it, okay? We're gonna be tapping into that. So, before we start seeing kind of any film play out in our mind, I want you to think back to that list you may have quickly just jotted where you had a few different ideas for scenes or stories that you could write, okay? Maybe you're going, oh, okay, I always wanted to write that story about that thing that happened to me, or I've always wanted to write that fictional story about that one cool character, whatever it is. Or maybe you're in the midst of a book right now and you're thinking about the next chapter or you're in the midst of one of your chapters, doesn't matter. Just kind of try to single out one particular scene or story or chapter that you're wanting to focus on for this exercise. And if you don't have one, that's okay. That's actually really fun to see what pops up, see what scene or story or chapter pops up as we're doing this, okay? Okay, so in your brain, on that film screen, 
is going to play out whatever scene or story or chapter that you're wanting to focus on for tonight. And the very first thing that you're going to visualize is the setting. Okay, but let's do this from a bird's eye view, almost as if the camera is hovering in the sky and it's looking down on the landscape below and really seeing this world where your story takes place from a zoomed out perspective. This place could be a totally made up, fictionalized world that you've created. It could be based on a real place you've been to or you haven't been to. It could be a place that's so familiar to you. You've, you've been there a million times. What I want you to do is really see this place. See this place. And look at it from that bird's eye view and see what you notice about the space below. Notice the shape. So maybe we're looking at an entire state, right? What is the shape of that state? Or we're looking at a particular region. What is the shape? What is the topography? What does it look like from that, that airplane view or that bird's eye view? What do you notice? And with every single description and visual that you see, you're gonna be asking yourself the same question, which is, how does this affect my narrative? How does this propel or deepen the plot? What do I mean by that? Well, okay. So say you're writing a story about a person who loves the water. They love the ocean. And when you look at this setting, all you see is desert land, dry land, right? You ask yourself, when, how does this affect the narrative? Well, right away, we have tension and opposition, right? Right away. Okay, so for each thing, you're thinking about it not just for the sake of describing something, but for how it affects the narrative, how it affects the characters, how it affects the plot how it propels the plot. So as you're looking at this setting, this landscape, this, or this, maybe this city, this space, see what you notice. What is there? Do we have buildings? Do we have nature? Do we have flat fields? Do we have high mountains? What do we have here? What's the shape? What are the visuals? What time of year is it? season, right? Our settings look very different depending on the season. So what season is it? And how does that affect the narrative? So characters move differently when it's zero degrees outside and it's gray and it's snowing and it's freezing. They huddle, their shoulders scrunch up to their ears, they scurry to their cars, right? The season affects the narrative. So notice in your story, what season is it? And even if it changes, just concentrate on, on maybe one season, that the kind of beginning of the story or scene or moment, and see what it looks like in this space. Right? Are there crunchy leaves on the ground, beautiful fall colors? Is it a scorching summer day? Is it vibrant spring? Is it frigid winter? And notice all these details. Feel the temperature of the air. And notice the time of day. Is it morning, afternoon, evening? And if you're writing you know, really interesting fiction. Maybe you're making up your own seasons. You're making up a new time of day that nobody's even heard of. The possibilities are endless. So you see all these details, right? You see the quality of light. Is it a gray overcast? Is it bright, beautiful, glimmery sun? What is it? 
And now allow the camera to zoom in. So we were at a bird's eye view, but now we're gonna get closer. Maybe we're getting into a city, village, neighborhood, until we get even closer or on a specific block or street or a specific place, a beach, a field. We're in somewhere, maybe we land kind of in a spot. So where does your story begin to take place? So are we in a room? Are we in a um, vehicle of some sort? car, a bus, a train, an airplane, mode of transportation. Are we outside? Where are we? So as we've zoomed in, let's kind of settle in a space where some things are starting to happen, right? You remember that one event that sets everything into motion? Be thinking about where that takes place, right? Are we in an office? Are we in a room? Are we in a kitchen? Are we, um, as I said, in a mode of transportation? Are we somewhere outside? Where are we? Where are the characters? And then look around. Do a sort of 360 spin around the space. And even if it's a very familiar space, see it with fresh eyes, almost as if you've never seen it before. And really take note of what's around, what's around this space. So maybe there are lots of objects, wall hangings, furnishings. Maybe it's outside and you're noticing natural found objects, sticks, rocks, leaves, sand grains, Maybe it's very sparse. With each thing, notice, observe, really inspect. And as you're seeing all this, you know, if you're feeling, oh, I'm so full of, I'm seeing so many things and I'm afraid I'm gonna forget them. You can always jot down a word or so on your notebook, but then always come back. Don't use, you know, this time to be writing frantically. Let yourself just see. But if you have, oh, that's a good detail. I need to remember that. Just jot it down and then come back, okay? So you're noticing all of these objects in this space. You're noticing the space itself. And as you notice these objects, you might ask yourself, which of these are really important? Which of these propel the plot? For example, someone gives something to someone else. That moves the plot, right? What is this thing? What is the history of the thing? What is the symbolism of the thing? Who did it belong to? Who is it given to? Why? The movement of a simple object can propel the plot. Maybe something else is happening in this space, right? The main character sees something and that even just sparks them. They see a letter on the table or they see a certain thing and then suddenly it sparks them to want to do something or try something or call someone. Anything can get the, the narrative moving. So with setting, we ask, how does it propel the plot? With objects, we ask, how does it propel the plot? With sensory details, we ask ourselves, how does it propel the plot? So for example, in this space, we already know the season, the time of year, the time of day, but then be thinking about the sensory details of this space. So sounds, far away sounds, what do we hear far away? Block away, mile away. What's in the distance? Is there a train going by? Is there the call of a coyote? Is there a child laughing? What's in the distance? And then what's close up? tapping of a pen, stirring of something on the stove, 
telephone ringing. And again, how does this set things into motion or how does it interrupt? How does it create complication? Characters trying to do something and then they get a message. They get a phone call, unexpected. Somebody comes to the door, complication, right? And that can be done through sound, simply through sound. Okay, and then think about smells, right? Mingling smells. And these could be two very different, almost opposing smells. Something that smells wonderful and something that's rotting. What, is, what are the smells that are in this space? And there might be story be behind that. And since our sense of smell is the thing that sparks memory the quickest, maybe it's making a character nostalgic, it makes them think about something, it sends them into a moment of reflection, flashing back. It adds layers, it develops the character and add something else to the plot. Okay, and then think about texture, right? So textures in this space. What do things feel like? Wood, the grain of wood or a soft blanket. Um, blisters or calluses on a hand intimacy, sense of touch. What does that do for your narrative? Right? And then you might also think about taste. There might be something, food or beverage, or even something abstract, you know, the taste of an abstract emotion. So you have all these wonderful sensory details coming together. You've got the setting, you've got all of these things, you've got objects, they're setting the scene. But now we're going to concentrate on the characters. So bring in almost like the characters coming on set, bring in your main character. And maybe it's a strong group leading of leading roles here. Let's concentrate one by one though, okay? So main character, they come into the scene. Get a good look at them. Start with their feet and work all the way up. Really just looking and observing to know this character deeply. And maybe if it's based on nonfiction or you're writing nonfiction, that character might be you. But be an observer now, looking at you then, right? As an outsider would. And just notice everything. Notice uh, stance, positioning, facial expression. Notice clothing. Notice all the external stuff that maybe even without hearing the character speak, we might know what's going on just by the way they're standing proudly or, or scrunching, becoming smaller, whatever it might be. What do you notice? What do you notice? And then get into their heads and their hearts. So what do they deeply desire? What do they want so badly? Desire is what drives plot often. What do they want? What do they yearn for? What do they fear? What, are, what stands in their way? What are they at risk of losing? What's at stake? This is the emotional layering that we really need. Because as I said, plot isn't just about action, 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 action. If we have no emotional undercurrent, we do not have a strong plot. This thing could happen, that thing could happen, but if we don't have the the undercurrent of emotion, of desire and fear and all of that, we, we don't have it. 
okay, so you've got this main character, bring in these other characters too. Not too many, but you know, just a few you're gonna focus on, or maybe there's just two. And take a look at them. And you're doing the same sort of thing, toes all the way up to head, and really getting a feel. And notice when you go into their head, their heart, likely there's a little bit of opposition, meaning that the other character may want something different or they're thinking about different things. Maybe they want the same thing, but they have different ideas of how to get there. And so automatically there might be tension or complication. Maybe one of these characters is an ally. They're there for support. They're there for mentorship. How do they show that? Okay, so start seeing your characters not static, but moving. Start seeing them in motion. And this is usually through gesture, right? Action and reaction, action and reaction, but also dialogue. What are they saying to each other? Then their nonverbals, facial expression, body language. Start to really see that at play. And think about the up down, think about the variation here. Notice what happens as things get complicated. What adds to the complication, the layering, the obstacles? And then what happens to create some newness, new characters, new ideas, new information, new path, new journey? See this, see this motion, this movement, action, reaction, dialogue, gesture, facial expression, body language, see it. And even if yours is not so wild of movement, that's okay. It could be very subtle shifts. That is okay. But there's some variation. And start to really see, okay, so your character wants something, what starts standing in their way? And then what adds some newness? Maybe some help or support. What are some of these moments of success for them, revelation for them, or growth for them? But then usually there is at least, at least one moment where it's really difficult. And usually we slow it down. It's almost like, you know, that one scene takes up a good amount of space. On a movie, it would be everything kind of in slow-mo. A single minute takes forever, right? There's usually a lead up to something happening, right? like Cheryl Strayed walking up to that empty water spot, turns the faucet, no water, sign on the water tank, no water, looking around frantically, no water, no water, no water, and it's really starting to amp up, okay? See that moment, feel that moment. This is the moment of your reader leaning and going, oh no, oh no, no. Because ultimately, the more a main character wants something, the more the reader wants it for them. And the more that's at stake, the more the reader is worried for them. And therefore the reader is engaged. Okay, and then how does our main character get themselves out or through or past? What do they do? At the end, how do we see growth? Okay, how do we see growth? Meaning, how is their, the character, the main character, different at the end than they were at the beginning? Even if it's just they have a different thought, they have a different idea, they see things a different way, they've worked through some things, they now understand something differently, there's some shift, there's some revelation, there's some growth, there is something there. See that. And then when you're ready, you can open your eyes. <laughs> okay, now 
I want to actually give you, at, mm, probably if we can, at least five minutes, maybe a little bit more, depending. I want you to be able to write down what you saw, okay? Now, this is the brain dump, okay? So this is not perfection on the page. This is just getting everything that was in here on here and you make sense of it later. No grammar, spelling, punctuation, none. don't worry about any of it. Just get on the page what you saw. So usually what I do is I just start from a moment that's taking my attention. And I just write. And when I come to a spot where I'm stuck, I just draw a line and I go to the next thing that I saw. Oh, that was an interesting object. Draw a line, go, okay? So I'm gonna give you about at least five minutes to just brain dump. And then hopefully, Solomon, maybe after that, you'll, you'll let me see some of these participants and we'll be able to share a little bit or at least talk about it, okay? So let's time ourselves. Five minutes from now, I'm gonna write with you. We're going to see what we wrote. Go for it. Five minutes, no, don't stop moving the pen. Go, 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 go.
Okay. Pause wherever you are. Write some notes for yourself for things you want to keep writing but didn't have enough time to. It's wonderful because when you go back to this tomorrow or some other time, you're, you've already got to start. That's why I love the scene development so much is because it's impossible to have writer's block once you've seen all that stuff in your head and you get words on the page, even just five minutes. Look how much you've written in five minutes. You know, I've got a page here. and. And it's just that sort of brain dumping of everything that you've seen. And later on, when you go to piece it together, when you go to make sense of these notes that you wrote, you just keep asking yourself, how does each of these descriptions propel the plot or drive the narrative forward? What does each thing do? How does the setting propel the narrative? How does the um, objects in this space, what do they do? Um, the desires of the character, how does that drive everything? Uh, how about the things that get in the way, the complications, right? So on and so forth. So make sure to write some notes for yourself as sort of guideposts for yourself for when you go back later. And now I wanna pause because I would love to hear from uh, some of you. What I would love is for each person uh, to maybe share a sentence, just a sentence. We don't need to hear the entire story or anything like that. Um, we are just asking you to share a single sentence to see how it went for you. Um, and, and Solomon, I saw that you um, unmuted, so I'll let you see how you want to go from here. Yeah, so we have um, someone raising their hand who I think wants to share. So, Denise, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yeah, welcome. Hi. Thanks for volunteering. Yay, go ahead and uh, read your, your sentence. Okay. Uh, okay. Do you want me to read my sentence or say ask questions? No. Go ahead and read a sentence. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of flounder through this because I just have real brief notes. But uh, uh, the pregnancy test at Student Services was positive, and the nurse loudly announced it to everyone in the waiting room. Excellent. Good. Okay. So I'm going to have each person just read a sentence. And then as each person reads, I'm going to just say a moment that's sticking out, right? So pregnant positive or positive pregnancy test, but the biggest thing that's sticking out is the, the nurse announcing it and what that does. Excellent. And we'll save some questions for just a little bit. So thank you, Denise. Mm -hmm. Let's have someone else share. Uh, something that they wrote, just a sentence. It just gives us a snippet and you don't feel like you're, you're bearing your soul, right? <laughs> yeah, you can share in the chat, everyone, or you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Excellent. Yeah, the chat too. If you don't want to verbally share, go ahead and put it in the chat. So just a single sentence. Joan. Floor is yours. Okay. In a sea of young Northern Europeans sporting dark tens, their pale skin stands out. Mm. Excellent. So we see the skin, right? We see the skin and the, the key thing is they're standing out. So it's almost like we're zooming in on that specific detail. Excellent, thank you, Joan. Yeah, as we're doing our writing, it's like, uh, I was just talking to some of my students about this, but it's about zooming in on certain details and then what that does and how the focus on that specific detail drives things. Very good, thanks, Joan. Okay, I see something in the chat. A big raccoon with bright eyes was stuck in a big bin and an elderly man was trying to help him. Thank you, May, I love this. Okay, so we see, uh, again, the zoom in, bright eyes, right? But being stuck in the bin. <laughs> um, and then specific detail, an elderly man trying to help him, good. Uh, and 
you know, as we're imagining this scene, we have so many questions that I would love to be engaged with as a reader. It's like, how did the raccoon get stuck in the bin? Why is this particular man helping him? Um, is the man afraid? Is he afraid of getting scratched or, or bitten or anything? Excellent, thank you so much, May. Good, other sentences. Uh, Deanne says, it was Anya's quest to stop this eternal winter taking over the world, but you know is the one who can do the magic. Ooh, oh yeah. Nice and detail oriented here. Okay, so stopping the eternal winter. Oh, that, that would be my nightmare. <laughs> eternal winter. Ah. Um, and so right away, we see the tension there. We see this one character on a quest to do something. Um, but this other character is the one who can do the magic. And so there's so much good tension here. Excellent. Good. Who else wants to share? Thank you, Deanne. These are so good. I love it. And, and notice, right, we all did the same exercise. But these stories are so different and the way you're all writing them is so, so different. So I'm so glad you're sharing your sentences. And, you know, in my workshops, it's always um, really positive feedback. So never be afraid to, to share a sentence here. We're really focusing on what's working, what's effective, what's standing out. Uh, so don't be shy, feel free to share. Let's go for at least one more and then we'll take some time for any questions that people might have. I really love hearing your work. It makes my day to see what came, came out of that. Uh, Kara, you have the floor. Ask your question or read your sentence. Not all storms come to disrupt your life. Some come to clear your path. Mmm, that's so good. Awesome. Okay. Um, so right away when we thank you, Kara, so much. So we see a storm coming, right? And automatically our initial reaction is always, oh, what damage will they do? But I love the imagery of clearing the path. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. All right, so what I want to say to everyone, you know, I'm always to hear, uh, happy to hear some more sentences, but if we take anything from today, you know, when we think about plot, we can really approach it in different ways than maybe we thought about it before. We can think about the tactile movement of it. We can think about physically plotting it out, right? But then we can also think about when we develop scenes in our brains, always asking ourselves, and how does this choice affect the narrative? How does it propel the plot? How does the choice of setting it in winter versus summer change things? How does the choice of inserting this object into the scene versus that object, how does that propel the plot? How does having a character wear this certain cloak or this certain piece of clothing, how does that choice propel the plot? I always tell the writers I work with, like, don't just write description for the sake of description, like, oh, it's a beautiful fall day. It should be a layer that develops the characters, develops the plot, moves the narrative along, okay? Um, so I'm more than happy to take any questions that may have popped up uh, during this, and then I'll um, share some, some fun things. What questions came up for you? Okay, ooh, so desert scene, two people get out of the Miata on the side of the road. There's a hot, dry tension. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's like this idea of these two characters on the side of the road in the desert. Like automatically we can feel the heat, we can feel the dryness. We're, we're wondering apart, uh, around what has landed them on the side of the road. Why are they there? Will they get out, right? So notice anytime you have questions forming in your reader's mind, they wanna go along on the journey with you. Thanks for sharing, Marlene. I really appreciate it. Excellent. Yeah, it looks like we have a hand up. Denise, awesome. uh, mm -hmm. floor is yours. Can you hear me? 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you think writing in chronological order is too regiment? And what do you think about using Roman numerals and then go l large A, little A, large B, little B, uh, kind of taking notes? Do you think it's, what do you think about that? Okay, so um, I'll answer the first question and then I, I'll want to make sure I have some clarity around the second question. So chronological order, I feel like people often resist chronological order because they feel like, oh, that's too boring. I never, never uh, think that it's a bad idea as long as it serves the narrative. That's a key thing here, right? Okay, so let's think about the choices that you make. There have been writers I've worked with who they were adamant, right? I don't want to write this in chronological order because that they automatically think that's associated with being boring. That's not true. The difference is if you choose to write in chronological order, it's about which scenes from the series of events you choose. So just because this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, doesn't mean you have to write about all eight events, right? It's about what you leave out that creates the tension, and it's about what you choose to keep that creates the tension. That's the key. Chronological order does not have to be boring so long as you figure out the most important things to choose. There are plenty of movies that have been um, scaled in chronological order that were intense, not because of the order itself, but because of the scenes that were chosen, right? That is the key thing. Um, can nonlinear structure work well too? Yes, but can nonlinear structure flop? Totally. It's all in the scenes that the author decides to choose. <laughs> That's the key thing. Okay, um, in terms of, Denise, you were talking about, can you write in Roman mental form where it's like Roman numeral one, then like writing a story in the form using Roman numerals. Am I understanding that right? Yeah, I, it was just, uh, when I was in high school, I was taught to take notes by an English teacher and I don't know if I could apply that also to my writing or, um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, so the difference I was asking if, if you were like applying that to outlining versus storytelling. So there's a really cool form that's called the hermit crab form. Uh, you should write this down if you don't know about the hermit crab. So hermit crab form um, the person who is kind of coined for coming up with the term is Brenda Miller. Um, she and her co-author wrote a really, really awesome book called Tell It Slant, and it's all about the hermit crab form. Hermit crab form is similar to what it sounds. Hermit crabs will take the shape of whatever shell that they find. In a hermit crab form, you can use any existing form, whether it's a recipe, a Roman numeral outline, a um, uh, eBay ad, doesn't matter, and you write a story using that form. It's super cool. So if you're into trying new forms, experimenting, I have a book on my shelf over here. It's called The Shell Game. It's an anthology of stories and essays that were written in interesting forms, like the form of an outline or something like that. And the anthology was edited, edited by a woman I knew in um, Boston, briefly met in Boston. Uh, her name is Kim Adrian. And she took all these cool hermit crab essays and stories and put them together in that book. And so if you want to write using some of these Roman numeral things, I would highly recommend checking out hermit crab essays, the shell game, Brenda Miller, all of those. Let me know if other people have questions too. Thanks, Denise. Thank you. Yeah. We do have uh, some time if people want to type in the chat or raise their hand. Yeah, go for it. And while we're doing that, I'm going to grab my plug because my laptop is almost dead. You can see my bookshelf. Okay, here we go. And um, as people are waiting, 
Um, I wanted to also say if any of you really enjoyed scene uh, development visualization, I do a really, really fun uh, thing with my community where we meet uh, regularly and we do quick prompts or quick scene development visualizations and then we write together on Zoom. Uh, and I actually have a three week challenge coming up. So it starts on Monday and we write together for um, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday for three weeks. And so I'll start it off. I call them writer workouts because they're like little workouts for writers. And uh, we start off with quick prompts or quick visualization and then we write and then I even leave a little bit of time for sharing if people want to, but they don't have to. And if people miss, I send the recording. So um, enrollment is open for that. So I'll put some links in the chat, but I just thought I'd mention it in case this was something you enjoy. Okay, Joan, um, you have the floor if you have a question. Yes, I do. Um, when you were saying that writing in chronological order, it does not have to be boring. It depends on uh, what events you choose to write about. Uh, and that's interesting. So events that are left out, are they events that you will bring in later on in the story or not necessarily? Okay, so I'll give you a few different examples, okay? So um, if you're writing uh, in chronological order and there are a series of things that happen, some of them don't propel the plot at all. So it's like, think about your day right? Think about all of the events in your day that are kind of mundane and don't have an actual huge effect on what happens. Brushing your teeth, so on and so forth. There are certain events that, that don't push the needle at all. They don't do anything. And so often I'll read work from writers where they're kind of struggling and it's because they've included all this stuff that doesn't, doesn't move the story along right? So I say, take out that metal junk. Like, let's just get right to it. Choose only the scenes that propel the plot. So think about Cheryl Strait. I keep on coming back to the same example, only because that's what we've been using for most of the time. So in Wild, she's hiking for 90 days. Are you going to read, um, you know, a thousand pages on hiking for her to describe every single detail that happened on the hike? And then I saw another tree and I saw another tree and I walked through more gravel and then I saw a blade of grass. No, right? She she left out all that stuff. Her story is told in chronological order. It has some flashbacks, but for the most part, we follow the hike. And then she inserts some other things that happen from her past, but we follow hike from beginning to end. The only thing that's majorly out of order is that her prologue is kind of flash forward, but we're following the hike chronologically. But what's left out is all this stuff that doesn't move the plot at all. So she includes, okay, the part where she um, has packed the wrong stove gas, right? And she includes the part where she meets people on the trail who are super helpful and they help her. She includes the part where she meets people on the trail who were not helpful and they were threatening and kind of dangerous. It's because those are the things that make the plot move. The other things, like the day in, day out, saw more trees, saw more grass, they happen in chronological order, but she didn't include those. So that I guess that's what I meant, Joan. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, that's, yeah, you're leaving out the verbiage that no one's really interested in. And yeah. then when you write a story that, um, I belong to a, a few book clubs, and I've known, in a couple of them, there are several people who really dislike books that jump around. I, I, mm. they, what is your, and I think partly it's because some people say they have a hard time keeping track when books jump around or they're getting into one story and you're certainly whisked off to another. Uh, what do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, like with anything, if you, people can pull off nonlinear structure as long as it keeps the reader's engagement. What does not keep the reader's engagement? Being completely confused. So there's a difference between 
pull of mystery, curiosity, and confusion, right? So yeah. what happens if, is, if you want to do nonlinear structure, that's totally great. You have to then rely on your transitions, your setup, your context in order for the reader to not be confused. There are plenty of wonderful um, stories told nonlinearly, uh, but you have to rely on, okay, did you give your reader time markers? Okay, and now we're in fall of 2020, or fall of 2020, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, here we're in spring of 1983. Here, like, are you giving your reader enough context that they're not confused? Then jump around all you want, as long as it's serving the narrative. And you just, you can't jump around for the sake of just jumping around because, oh, it's gonna be cool for me to jump around. I always ask the question, like, is this serving the narrative? So, um, so, what I mean by that is kind of like uh, you know, my son, okay, my son's seven. Uh, he could wear a super cool, like creative outfit where maybe he has a green shirt, he has rainbow pants, he has, I don't know, some kind of hat on, right? And he'll look interesting. But if we go outside and it's 20 degrees outside and he's in thin layers, like, is that serving him right then? <laughs> Well, no, he needs to put on, you know, the right outfit. So it's the same with our narratives where it's like, okay, I'm going to do this interesting nonlinear thing for the sake of creating suspense, tension, unraveling a mystery. I'm going to do that. And therefore, you're serving the narrative. You're not just doing it for mm -hmm. the of being interesting. A person who's famous for this, um, for a nonlinear plot structure is Abigail Thomas, but she makes it work because one, you're not confused, and two, the way the scene she chooses and the order she chooses them makes you super curious. You're mm -hmm. really curious. You want to know, you know, where is this going? How is this all going to tie together in the end? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you, Nadine. A lot of comments saying thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, someone asked, Marlene asked, can you repeat the info for your exercise coming up? Definitely. So we just put three links in there. That'll be helpful. So I have that three-week writing challenge um, next week. And actually tonight, the early bird price ends. So um, I'm glad that I fell on tonight, this workshop. So check out the three-week writing challenge. We've got an awesome group already signed up. You'll love them. They're super supportive. Um, and it really is all about making a commitment. Oh, we can't see the links in the chat. Okay. Um, so if you can't see the links, then I, it's easy because my, yeah, website, I can again. Yeah. Yeah, my website is my name. So nadinekennyjohnstone.com. And so I have a workshops tab and you'll see the three week challenge there. Um, but then also um, nadinekennyjohnstone.com slash community is where you can sign up for my newsletter. I don't overwhelm you. I just send out every Friday. I send out great books I'm reading, cool workshops that are coming up. Um, and also when people sign up, I, I give a wonderful kind of free uh, journaling prompt exercise that I really love. It's like my favorite journaling exercises. And as my web designer, Elizabeth, put it together. It's so beautiful. Um, and then also, uh, I'm not on social media all the time, but um, Maybe once a week, I, I post a cute picture of uh, something in nature or, or my family, but also that's where I announce my workshops as well. So you have a few different ways to see what might be coming up so we can get in touch. But everything is my name, Nadine Kenny Johnstone. Thank you all for, for coming tonight. I know that people, you know, you're probably sick of your computers by now, but you were here and I really, really appreciate it so much. I think uh, Denise has a question. Uh, what, is, what is the fee for your workshop? Yeah, so you'll see that um, I have various fees. So the three weeks is one ninety-seven, and um, but I have a lot of fun stuff. So um, sometimes I do. Um, 
four days of free writing fest. Uh, so that comes up, that'll probably come up in 2021. Um, I'm always offering different things. So, uh, and some things are like one night workshops. So I offer master classes. I offer multi-week programs. I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching all the good things. So um, for, for the winter, I will be announcing um, some great coaching stuff that I do um, because I'm a writing coach. I love working with people on their books, on their essays, uh, on their stories. So there are lots and lots of things you'll find on the workshop page. Yeah, thanks for asking, Denise. Um, and I can send out the links for the writing challenge and the journaling prompts. Um, if you if you signed up for this workshop, I have your email so I can send that out. Oh, thank you so much. They really appreciate it. Yeah. And, you know, regardless, if, if we, um, if you just, if you can't make the challenge, but want to be part of the community, um, I would love for our paths to cross at some point. So I can see your faces on, <laughs> on Zoom and uh, we can write together in some way. I love these sorts of workshops. So yeah, no problem. Thanks for the kind comments, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. Yeah. This was a wonderful workshop. Um, before we end for the night, I do want to give uh, two reminders. So we have um, the short story contest, the second annual short story contest is open and accepting submission. Um, so you can submit anytime from now until November 6th. Um, you can also find more information about um, the prizes and entry guidelines at champagne.org slash short dash story. And then our next workshop will be finishing your story on November 4th with Molly McCray. So be sure to sign up for that one. And I want to, again, thank Nadine for leading such a wonderful webinar. That was great. Um, a lot of great comments saying thank you. Thank you for your advice and hard work. And I completely agree. It was wonderful. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy that you reached out. It really was a pleasure. And you are a wonderful host. So thank you. Thank you. Well, with that, we will call it a night. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We'll see you at the next workshop. All right. Bye.